Hello, everyone. We welcome you and thank you for joining today's Safety and Health webcast sponsored by JJ Keller. Just want to let you know as you log on that you're in the right place. This can allow about another minute for everyone to uh, get settled in, but we'll be beginning the presentation in a little less than a minute. Thank you. Hi, everyone. We thank you again for joining us, letting you know you're in the right place for today's webinar. Going to get going in about 30 seconds as a few more people uh, get settled in and logged on. Thank you. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Safety and Health webcast, the ins and outs of HASCOM training, what you need to know to stay in compliance, sponsored by J.J. Keller. My name is Kevin Drewley. I'm an associate editor with Safety and Health magazine, and I'll be moderating today's session. Thanks for joining us. We hope you all are safe and well. In a few minutes, we'll start the presentation, but first, let's review some preliminary items. The views of today's speakers and organizations are their own and do not necessarily reflect those of the National Safety Council or Safety and Health magazine. Any mention of a commercial enterprise, product, or publication does not mean the council or magazine endorses those items. At the end of today's webcast, we'll conduct a question and answer session. To ask a question, simply click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, type your question, and click the send button. Feel free to ask your question at any time during the presentation. You don't have to wait for the question and answer session to begin. We'll try to answer as many questions as possible, but because of the large number of participants today, we might not get to every question. Any unanswered questions will be forwarded along to today's speakers. At the end of the webcast, you'll be asked to complete a brief evaluation survey. I'll let you know more about that after the presentation. This webcast is archived, so you can access it after today's live event. To view this webcast and all of our past webcasts, go to safetyandhealthmagazine.com slash events. With that, let's go ahead and get started. Our speakers today are Rachel Krupsack and Derek Plowden. Rachel is an EHS editor at J.J. Keller who writes a monthly newsletter on employee safety training and manages publications on hazard communication compliance and OSHA rules for general industry. Her areas of expertise include hazard communication, hearing conservation, training requirements, bloodborne pathogens, and emergency action plans. Derek is also an EHS editor at J.J. Keller who manages publications such as the OSHA rules for construction activities and OSHA compliance for construction activities manuals. He also writes for the HAZ Safety Training Advisor, contributes to external publications, and specializes in topics including personal protective equipment, ergonomics, and injury and illness record keeping. Rachel and Derek, we thank you for being with us today. Whenever you're ready, go ahead and take it away. Okay, thank you and welcome everyone. Today's webcast is sponsored by the JJ Keller Chemical Management Service. With this service, you can get help from J.J. Keller experts to manage your chemical inventory and SDS library, ensure proper labeling, and save you a lot of time, and give you the confidence that it's done right and you're in compliance. This service provides support and guidance for these core areas of your HASCOM program. On behalf of the J.J. Keller Chemical Management Service, welcome to today's webcast. Today, we'll look at the training requirements in OSHA's Hazard Communication or HASCOM standard. But first, we'll take a brief look at how many times OSHA has cited lack of training under the HASCOM standard and what the risks of noncompliance are. Then, we'll provide a broad overview of the HASCOM standard, who is covered, and what exceptions apply. And finally, we'll delve into what's required under the standard for training. Hazard communication is always found in OSHA's top 10 list of most frequently cited serious violations. These are the numbers from 2021, where you can see that three of the top 10 serious violations are related to HASCOM. You can see that missing or inadequate measures to provide hazard information to employees or provide proper training was the second most commonly cited cita HASCOM cita violation with 550 citations. Recently, an employer in South Dakota faced penalties of over $120,000 after an employee was asphyxiated while handling liquid nitrogen. In this instance, OSHA found several violations of the HASCOM standard, including lack of a written hazard communication program and chemical inventory, unlabeled containers of hazardous chemicals, no safety data sheets, and lack of training on chemicals, their hazards, and protective measures. 
When it comes to training, what are the risks of non-compliance? No one wants to be out of compliance, but if you're ever tempted to cut costs by sidetracking training, consider the consequences. If you don't provide training, you're at risk for some large OSHA fines. Training violations are typically cited as serious violations, which carry a fine of $14,000, 502 each. A serious violation is defined by OSHA as one in which there is substantial probability that death or serious physical harm could result, and the employer knew or should have known of the hazard. Another risk of noncompliance is a workplace injury, illness, or fatality. When an employee isn't sure of what they're doing, they have an increased risk for injury or illness. Injuries and illnesses come with costs that are likely to be higher than OSHA fines. Some direct costs may include medical bills, repairs to any damaged equipment, product losses, and costs to hire and train replacement workers. And you'll also want to consider potential indirect costs, such as decreased morale and productivity in coworkers, increases in your workers' compensation premiums, and lost business contracts due to having a higher experience modification rate. In addition, your reputation in the community and industry can take a hit if the injury, illness, or fatality is publicized. Derek? Awesome, thanks, Rachel. I just wanna provide a brief overview of the hazard communication standard um, and some, kind of some intricacy, intricacies within that standard. Um, but first, it's, it's just about knowing that hazardous chemicals are needed to help manufacture many of the products that we all use on a daily basis. And OSHA estimates that around 43 million, yes, I said 43 million, uh, workers produce or even handle hazardous chemicals in more than 5 million of those workplaces across the country. If that sounds like a lot, it's because it is, which also means that the potential for accidents and incidences and injuries are always present when people work with or even around hazardous chemicals. I'm telling you this because knowing and understanding the basic nature of those chemicals and even like how to safely work with or around them can help people greatly decrease any risk that might be present. It should essentially go without saying that the more awareness employers and employees, and yes, employers, management as well, uh, the more awareness that they have, the better. To ensure chemical safety in the workplace, information about the identities and the hazards of the chemicals must be available and even understandable to employees. I'll cover that in training in just a little bit, but OSHA's HASCOM standard requires you to communicate that specific information to employees, right, so that they're safe on the job. And OSHA says that employees have the right to know and understand the hazards of the chemicals that they work with in the workplace, uh, the hazards of working with those chemicals, so handling them on a day-to-day -day basis. And they also require that you ensure employees understand what steps they can take to protect themselves and those that they work with from hazards, right? Because supervisors and management all alike are not going to constantly be around employees to make sure that they're safe. Um, it's generally best if employees also know how to protect themselves while on the job. Now, in order to understand the HASCOM standard and the information and training requirements, you really need to first understand what a hazardous chemical is. The HASCOM standard defines a hazardous chemical uh, here as any chemical which is classified as a physical hazard or even a health hazard, a simple asphyxiant, combustible dust, pyrophoric acid, or other hazard not otherwise classified. And we don't expect you to memorize that definition. I haven't memorized it myself yet, but we do want to make clear that OSHA's definition is important. Uh, it's essentially a guide that you can use to make clear how a chemical is defined. Whenever I feel uncertain, I always just look at the definition right away. And the same is really true for all the other definitions that OSHA provides within the standard. Now the term health hazard and physical hazard are defined. For some of you who are wondering, that is located at 1910. Dot 1200, so 1200, 1200 paragraph C. A health hazard or physical hazard is classified as posing one of the hazardous effects listed in their respective columns, uh, which you can see here on this slide. Basically, one column has health hazards, the other has a physical hazard. And so that's basically how they're listed. Hazards refer to any inherent property of a substance that's really capable of causing an adverse effect on employees. Uh, chemical exposure can cause or contribute to many serious adverse health effects, such as cancer, um, sterility issues, 
are some that we've heard heart disease, lung damage, and even burns. Some chemicals are also physical hazards and have the potential to cause fires within your facility or even explosions and other dangerous incidents. Now I want to briefly mention a hazardous chemical also may be classified as a simple asphyxiant, combustible dust, a pyrophoric gas, or hazard not otherwise classified. Again, um, combustible dust is defined by a directive, and you can find that in the CPL 03-00008. Just another thing that you want to keep in mind. Okay, thanks, Derek. So with some exceptions, if your employees are exposed to hazardous chemicals, you're covered under the HAZCOM standard. And this is the first of two slides that contain some exemptions. And let's take a closer look at some of these. So certain hazardous substances are regulated by other agencies, and therefore OSHA has exempted them from coverage by the HAZCOM standard. One of these things is articles are exempted by OSHA. The standard defines an article as a manufactured item other than a fluid or particle, which is formed to a specific shape or design during manufacture, has end use functions dependent in whole or in part upon its shape or design during end use, and must not release more than very small quantities of a hazardous chemical or pose a physical hazard or health hazard to employees under normal conditions of use. And it may be difficult to define what is considered normal conditions of use. An employer may have a manufactured item that meets the definition of an article, but if it's burned, it produces a hazardous byproduct. The question then becomes, is burning normal use for the product? If burning occurs during its normal use and more than trace amounts of a hazardous byproduct are produced, then it cannot be exempted as an article. Normal use does not include incidental exposure. And if a hazardous chemical can be expected to be released only when the item is repaired, that is not considered part of its normal condition of use. The item would then be considered an article under the standard and thus be exempted. So some examples of these would be like stainless steel tables, vinyl upholstery, and tires. So basically, if the product will be processed in some way after leaving the manufacturing site, such as heated, welded, glued, or sawed, and a hazardous chemical could be emitted, it probably will not qualify for the article exemption. We often get questions about consumer products. The HASCOM standard does not cover consumer products such as kitchen cleanser when the products are used in the workplace in such a way that the duration and frequency of use, and therefore a person's exposure, is not greater than what the typical consumer would experience. So however, this example exemption is based on how it actually is used in the workplace rather than the chemical manufacturer's intended use of the product. For instance, if an kitchen cleanser to clean the sink in the break room twice a week, that would be considered normal consumer exposure. However, if that employee cl cleans all of the sinks and all of the building's break rooms every day, that would exceed normal consumer exposure and the provisions of the HESCOM standard would apply. You also don't need to worry about the HESCOM standard for items in first aid cabinets. Drugs intended for personal consumption by employees while they're in the workplace are exempted. If your operations and your chemicals are not entirely exempted and you're left with some covered hazardous chemicals that your employees are exposed to, you must provide training to these employees. And this applies to general industry, shipyard, marine terminals, longshoring, and construction employment. The HASCOM standard defines exposure or exposed to mean that an employee is subjected in the course of employment to a chemical that's a physical or health hazard and includes potential that's, for example, like accidental or possible exposure. Subjected in terms of health hazards includes any route of entry, for example, inhalation, ingestion, skin contact, or absorption. OSHA defines employee as any worker who may be exposed to hazardous chemicals under normal operating conditions or in foreseeable emergencies. Normal operating conditions are those which employees encounter in performing their job duties in their assigned work areas. So for example, if the receptionist in a facility receives and delivers a phone message for someone in a different work area where hazardous chemicals are present, this does not mean that the receptionist would be covered under the rule by virtual, virtue of that one potential exposure from delivering the message. However, if performance of the receptionist job entails walking through the production area every day, and thus they're potentially exposed during the performance of regular duties, that job would be covered under the standard. And as another example, a housekeeping staff member who's expected to clean up a, 
um, hazardous substances like mercury from a broken thermometer, that person also would require training. If you have some employees who are occasionally in an area where chemicals are stored or used, and you're undecided whether they're exposed, it's best to include them in your training program, because really it's better to train too many workers than too few. You know, Rachel had mentioned normal employees, but when we're talking about temporary employees, things can get a little confusing because some folks don't really understand yet how to train a temp employee or who is supposed to train the temp employee. And some of you might think, well, it's just the staffing agency that has to train the employee. And some of you might think, well, it's just the host employer's responsibility, right? Because they're the ones on site and uh, understand, you know, the hazards that are in their workplace. And while that is true, Training is really a shared responsibility between the staffing agency and the host employer. And in general, the staffing agency takes care of the general requirements for HASCOM, training employees on the types of chemicals they'll likely uh, encounter. So that's what I was talking about earlier when I said that the uh, host employer is generally responsible for that sort of thing. Staffing agencies can also train employees on general personal protective equipment or even PPE, including how to put the equipment on and take it off and also how to read safety data sheets and how to read labels. And I should mention, it's really important that you, the employer and the agency communicate effectively amongst yourselves and with your employees. We've heard cases where the employee was never trained or told safety information because the agency was pointing fingers at the host employer saying they were supposed to train and the host employer <laughs> were pointing fingers at the agency saying they were supposed to train. It's really a shared responsibility again. And communication is key, not just between you and the agency, but also with the employee as well. Now the host employer is responsible for site specific hazards. As I had mentioned earlier, the, the chemicals that they'll work with um, and the chemicals that they'll be exposed to and any particular hazards of the job this includes training on what to do in an emergency and how, and whether to clean up spills, where to find safety data sheets and any other in-house labeling systems. Now in a temporary worker initiative bulletin regarding temporary workers and HASCOM, I wanted to read this off because it's something that OSHA actually said. They said that the host employer holds the primary responsibility for providing site specific hazard communication information and training on chemical hazards in the workplace. And that's to temp employees since the host employer uses or produces those hazardous chemicals and creates and controls the work processes that the employee will be involved in. Again, OSHA's specific words. They also say that the host employer is therefore best suited to inform employees of the chemical hazards specific to the workplace environment through site specific training. So just something to keep top of mind. Now, the next question that usually comes is a when, uh, as it regards to training, employees must be trained at the time of initial assignment prior to that initial exposure to a chemical that they'll be working with. And also, of course, whenever a new chemical hazard is introduced into the workplace, there's no annual training requirement. Um, training has to be done either by an individual chemical or by categories of hazards, such as flammability. If there are only a few chemicals in the workplace, then the employer may want to discuss each one individually. And of course, then there's the case where there might be a large number of chemicals or the chemical changes frequently. I know some of you may be experiencing that. You'll probably want to train generally based on the hazard categories such as flammable liquids, corrosive materials, or carcinogens. Employees will have access to that substance specific information on the label and SDS within their work areas, of course. And so the ASCOM standard doesn't really set requirements for specific refresher training. I know I mentioned there's no annual training again. Um, there's no specific requirements for refresher training. However, if employees are not putting into practice what was covered in training, it's time to revisit that training to ensure that you know, they're safe on the job and that they understand exactly what they're doing. If retraining does happen, it may not be necessary to repeat your entire HASCOM training program. So if an employee you know, exhibits some signs of not understanding specific training um, that you had issued earlier on within the year, uh, it's not necessary that you're going to have to retrain them specifically on everything that you train them on, but maybe one specific aspect. OSHA says that if you can document through evaluation measures that some or even most in, um, knowledge and skills have been retained, there's really no need to repeat those parts of the HASCOM training program. Again, you may only need to focus on gray areas where you're not sure employees are retaining specific information. So for example, if employees can tell you where the hazard communication uh, program is located, 
then there is no need to repeat that information in training. Likewise, if they can satisfy um, your objective, specifically questions that you provide them, uh, let's say you're asking them if they know the methods and observations that they have to use to detect any presence or release of hazardous chemical in the work area. If they know the answer to that question when you give it to them, again, there's no need to go over that part of the training within your program. But of course, we wanna make mention that the opposite is true if they can't explain those parts of your training confidently, right? And so when I say confidently, I mean on the spot, if you were to ask an employee um, and they kind of look a little hesitant or they're, they're unsure of themselves or unsure of their answer, uh, and you can generally tell this sort of thing. Some of you might've experienced this before, um, but you can generally tell when you're like, okay, it might be time for some retraining on a specific subject. Again, if it's one specific question you ask them, you might not need to retrain them on everything. Um, so hopefully that kind of helps save you a little bit of time, but of course be well aware of, of other aspects of your training that they might not be as comfortable with as well. Now, as we mentioned, additional training is done whenever a new physical or health hazard is introduced into the work area, not necessarily a new chemical. For example, if a new solvent is brought into the workplace and its hazards are similar to existing chemicals, uh, you know, for which you've already trained or, or shown employees, then no new training is required there. On the flip side, just as, as an example, um, if newly introduced solvent that you have in your workplace is a suspect carcinogen, and there's never been one in your workplace before, then you might need new training for carcinogenic hazards. Um, again, it's not necessary that you retrain each new hire if that employee has received prior training uh, by a past employer on a specific hazard, but again, just some things to keep in mind. Um, the standard also requires that employees be trained on the measures that they can take to protect themselves from hazards, including specific procedures that the employer has implemented, such as like work practices, even emergency procedures and personal protective equipment. So again, the employer has responsibility to evaluate an employee's level of knowledge with regard to the hazards in the workplace. And that includes the chemicals that are already there and chemicals that come in that are similar and ones that are completely different. Again, you're gonna wanna retrain um, and then adjust your program based on where you kind of land on that scale. Okay, and with that, let's delve into what specific training and information are required under the standard. Employers must provide certain information to employees and train employees on specific topics. So let's first look at the information requirements. The HASCOM standard requires employees to be informed of the general requirements of the HASCOM standard, where hazardous chemicals are located in their work areas, so that's where operations where exposure may occur, and the location and availability of the employer's written HASCOM program, chemical inventory, and safety data sheets, or SDSs. In addition to pro providing this information to workers, they must be trained on the following topics. The methods and observations that may be used to detect the presence or release of a hazardous chemical in their work area, and this might be um, monitoring conducted by the employer or continuous monitoring device, devices, visual appearance, or maybe the odor of the hazardous chemical that's being released. Um, they also need to be trained on the physical health, simple asphyxiation, combustible dust, and pyrophoric gas hazards, as well as any hazards not otherwise classified of the chemicals in their work area. The measures employees can take to protect themselves from these hazards, including appropriate work practices, emergency procedures, and personal protective equipment or PPE to be used and the details of the written HASCOM program you've developed, including an explanation of the labels received on shipped containers and the workplace labeling system you use, and that's if it's different than what's on shipped containers, and the SDS, which would include the order of the information and how employees can obtain and use the appropriate hazard information. Today's webcast is sponsored by the JJ Keller HASCOM Chemical Safety Management Service. With this new service, get help from JJ Keller experts to manage your chemical inventory and SDS library, ensure proper labeling and compliance. We can even review and update your written hazard communication program. And last, we will provide regular reporting and communication on your HASCOM program performance. If you'd like more information on the JJ Keller HASCOM Chemical Management Service, let us know by selecting your interest on the poll. And as a thank you, we'll email a copy of our brand new compliance brief 
the top seven HASCOM violations. And while we're waiting here for the poll, we will take one a, seed, a question here from that we've seen up on the chat. Um, do we have to provide HASCOM training if we have fewer than 10 employees? Um, yes, basically there's not a magic number of employees that um, you have to provide training for. If you, but even if you have one employee who's exposed to one hazardous chemical, you do need to provide training to that person. So let's take a closer look at training as it relates to labels and SDSs. Your training must address the following. An explanation of the labels received on shipped containers, the in-house labeling system that you use if it's different than what comes in on shipped containers, the format of the SDS, which contains 16 standardized sections, how the label information relates to SDS information, and if you have material safety data sheets or MSDSs for any chemicals that you use, you must train employees on how to read them. And there's a note here on MSDSs. I know maybe not too many people have these anymore, but in a letter of interpretation, OSHA says that they won't issue citations if employers maintain MSDSs when they haven't received an, MS, an SDS for a product. So as long as you're maintaining that most recent version of the MSDS or SDS that you've received from the chemical manufacturer, the importer or distributor, you're in compliance. The label is an immediate type of warning since it's present in the work area, right on the actual container of a hazardous chemical. It's a snapshot of the hazards and protective information related to a chemical and a summary of the more detailed information that you can find on the SDS. So while labels provide important information for anyone who handles, uses, stores, and transports hazardous chemicals, they're really limited by design and the amount of information they can provide. Safety data sheets are that more complete resource for details regarding hazardous chemicals. And we're going to talk about them a little bit later in the webcast. The labels you receive on shipped containers must include the information shown on the slide located together in the same field of view. And it's important to be sure and inform employees of what to do or who to contact if they come across an unlabeled container in the workplace. So let's take a closer look at these label elements. The product identifier is, you know, the how the hazardous chemical is identified. And this can be, but is not limited to the chemical's name. There's even a code number or batch number. The manufacturer, the importer, or distributor gets to decide the appropriate product identifier. And the same identifier must be both on the label and in section one of the safety data sheet. Now, the signal word is used to indicate the relative level of severity, let's call that, of a hazard and alert workers to a potential hazard. The signal word uses um, words like danger and warning. Danger is used for the more severe hazards while warning is used for less severe hazards. Now, there'll only be one signal word on the label, no matter how many hazards a chemical may have. So it's not likely that you'll have to expect multiple different signal words uh, that'll be used. The hazard statement is a statement that describes the nature of the hazard of a chemical, including where appropriate uh, the degree of a hazard. The precautionary statement is a phrase that describes recommended measures that you might have to take to minimize or even prevent adverse effects resulting from exposure or even in proper storage or handling of hazardous chemicals. There are really four types of precautionary statements, which are prevention. The other one is response, and then there's storage and disposal. Of course, along with those pictograms, there are graphic symbols essentially that are used to convey uh, very specific information about the hazard of a chemical, each pictogram consists of a different symbol. And typically you'll see that on like a white background with a red square frame set on a point. So what I mean is it'll look essentially like a diamond and it's actually pictured here on the slide for you. So um, yeah, again, just another thing to keep in mind that each pictogram will generally consist of a different symbol on that specific uh, background. And before I want, I actually want to take a question here. Um, so before I continue into this slide, um, and Kevin, I'm sorry, I don't mean to step on your toes here because I know we're going to have a Q&A at the end, but somebody, I was talking about training earlier and someone asked, Does, doesn't OSHA require annual HASCOM training? And I just want to clarify, 
um, because I hope I, I didn't uh, mislead anyone, but the standard does not require an annual training or even refresher training at specified intervals. Um, you have to provide initial training, right? So that's your set point. And then expect employees to remember that information, hopefully, right? Um, whether that's, you know, by way of quiz or however you decide to do that. But of course, you can't expect employees to remember information, you know, for years <laughs> after you provided that training. That's not really, you know, really realistic. Um, but again, it's just that refresher training as you see fit, right? If your employees can't answer questions about training that was just previously even recently delivered, then refresher training is going to be a good idea. Um, in addition, if there are changes to your written program that would impact employees, additional training, again, is likely needed. So I hope that clarifies the question for you. Now let's get a little in-depth on labels. The HASCOM standard requires pictograms on labels to alert users of chemical hazards, uh, which I was talking about earlier. Each pictogram has to have a specific meaning conveying the health and physical hazard information for a chemicals hazard class and even the category. While nine pictograms are depicted on this slide, OSHA only enforces the use of eight of them because one of them is actually uh, tailored to the environment and OSHA has no oversight of the environmental um, side that's really more EPA stuff. So eight of them that you see here are actually enforceable, not all nine. Now, if you choose to use alternative in-house labels, um, I know some of you might be doing that, such as an HMIS or NFPA, um, on any of your containers of hazardous chemicals, you must ensure that, that your training program instructs employees on how to use and even understand the alternative labeling system so that they're aware of the effects of the hazardous chemicals to which they're potentially exposed to throughout the day. Now, some options for in-house labeling include following the labeling requirements for ship containers, uh, as we discussed earlier. However, for in-house purposes, you're not really required to include the name, address, and phone number of the responsible party on the label. Alternately, the in-house label can be just the product identifier and words, pictures, or symbols that convey the general hazard information regarding physical and health hazards of the hazardous chemical. Now, I'm not necessarily going to suggest here that you put a ton of information on there. Obviously, you want to put what's required, but it might be also best practice to include some of um, you know, the, the more detailed information so that way employees can be as safe as possible while they're working. As we mentioned, OSHA does allow for employers to use the HMIS-3 and NFPA systems uh, for in-house labeling. If they're used in accordance with the NFPA and HMIS guidelines, and as long as it doesn't you know, cast doubt or contradict the validity of the label information, um, then that's okay. Employers must ensure that their training programs instructs employees on how to use and understand the alternative labeling systems so that they're aware of the effects of hazardous chemicals uh, to which they use every day. Okay, let's now let's take a look at what employees need to know about safety data sheets. The STS contains all the elements you see on this slide. The important areas for employees to understand are the sections on what the health effects of exposure to the chemical could be. What should they watch out for? Should they suspect they've been exposed to a chemical if they have difficulty breathing or if they get a rash? Employees will learn from the STS if the chemical requires special precautions, such as not exposing it to water or heat, or whether it can handle rough treatment. Knowing the firefighting measures is important for knowing whether a standard portable fire extinguisher will work to put out a fire involving that chemical, or if you need a certain type of extinguisher. One reason OSHA requires STSs to be readily available and accessible to employees is so they can quickly find emergency and first aid procedures for chemical exposures to that chemical. Do they need to get the employee medical attention as soon as possible? Do they have to flush the eyes or skin for a certain amount of time? Is washing with soap and water appropriate? Knowing the recommended spill containment methods can help employees avoid injury when there's been a spill or release. Can they simply soak up or sweep up a spill or do they need to apply a neutralizing agent first? Handling and storage are important to help employees know when they should avoid using the chemical with other chemicals. So for example, an SDS for a container uh, cleaner that contains bleach will caution against using that cleaner with ammonia. The SDS will contain information on when to wear PPE and what type of PPE is appropriate. 
and the physical and chemical properties will tell you if the chemical is liquid, gas, or solid. Maybe what color it is, what it smells like, or if it's odorless, its pH value or flammability, et cetera. And this kind of thing is important to know to see if the chemical is also covered by other OSHA standards, such as the flammable liquid standard at 1910-106. Section 10 lists the stability and reactivity. For instance, what happens if you drop a box of the chemical or if it's exposed to water or air? And note that the information found in sections 12 through 15 can be very valuable, especially when it comes time to dispose of that chemical, but OSHA does not enforce these sections. Other agencies, such as the Department of Transportation, regulate the information required to be in these sections. These sections will also let you know if the chemical falls under the reporting requirements for EPA recording, reporting programs, such as the toxics release inventory. As we mentioned earlier, employees must be informed of the location of SDSs in the workplace. They also must know what to do or who to contact if an SDS is missing. SDSs may be kept in hard copy or electronic format and must be readily accessible during each work shift to employees when they're in their work area. There must be no barrier to employer access, such as having to ask a supervisor for an SDS or keeping SDSs in a locked cabinet. And if you maintain your SDSs on a company website or um, an off-site web-based SDS service provider that provides them electronically, um, you do have to ensure a few things here. All employees have adequate access with no restrictions. Make sure there's a backup procedure or system in place in case the system is not functioning. Make sure that employees are trained on how to access the SDSs, both on the computer and your, any backup system you have and that there's a procedure or backup in place to ensure that employees can receive a hard copy if they want one and in cases of emergency. It's not acceptable to only transmit the information verbally. In the event of a medical emergency, hard copy SDSs must be immediately available to medical personnel. So there must be an adequate backup system for rapid access to SDSs in the event of power outages, equipment failures, or other system failure. The employer who brings a hazardous chemical onto a multi-employer worksite must inform the other employers of the presence of the hazardous chemical and the availability of the SDS. If an intermediary employer, such as a general contractor, provides access to the SDSs, that employer is responsible for ensuring the availability of the SDSs. If SDSs are not available because a subcontractor or immediate employer failed to make them readily accessible, that employer will be cited. For workplaces such as warehouses or retail sales, where employees do not normally open sealed containers of hazardous chemicals, that employer need only maintain the SDSs that are sent with incoming shipments. If an employee requests an SDS and it's not available, the employer must contact the manufacturer and request one. So the primary difference is that the warehouse or a hardware store does not have to maintain a complete file of safety data sheets. As we mentioned earlier, employees must be trained in the details of your written hazard communication program. So let's spend a little time going over what that means. Simply put, a written HAZCOM program is a record of how your organization will comply with the HAZCOM standard. And the HAZCOM standard requires all employers, including those on multi-employer work sites, who may expose their employees or employees of other employers, such as temporary employees or contractors, to hazardous chemicals to develop a written program. And a note here is that the written HASCOM program requirement does not apply to, lab apply to laboratories or operations where employees handle only sealed containers of hazardous chemicals, such as in warehouses or retail sales. Your program does not need to be lengthy or complicated, but it should provide enough details about your workplace HASCOM training program to assess whether or not a good faith effort is being made to train workers. You may maintain the program either in paper or electronic format, as long as employees have access to it upon request. If your employee's job assignment requires travel between various geographical locations, you may keep your written program at your primary work location. And finally, the program must be avail available upon request to not just your employees, but also their designated representatives and any OSHA officials. Awesome, thank you, Rachel. Uh, a lot of folks ask us what a written HASCOM program has to include, and we've included it here on this slide for you, so that way you can kind of get an understanding of what your program has to address uh, in your workplace. And specifically, we're looking at labels and other forms of warning, 
safety data sheets. That one kind of goes uh, without saying. Employee information, of course, training, which I had covered earlier. The chemical inventory list, hazards of non-routine tasks, and then hazards associated with chemicals in unlabeled pipes, and then multi-employer workplaces. And so again, your RIN HASCOM program has to include all of these things within it. Of course, there's going to be more detailed information within there that you're going to want to address. But with that, a lot of folks ask us how to handle HASCOM on multi-employer workplaces. And so that's where I'll kind of focus today. Um, where there's more than one employer operating on a site, essentially, right? And employees are exposed to the chemicals used by other employers, your written HASCOM program has to address how on-site access to SDSs will be provided to other employer, uh, other employers within that workplace. Now, you don't have to, you know, physically give the other employers the SDS, but rather you'll have to inform others of the location of where that SDS will be maintained, such as in a general employer's trailer. This sort of thing typically happens like on construction sites. Second, you must address how these employers will be informed of any needed precautionary measures. And finally, you'll also have to address how the other employers will be informed of your in-house labeling system if it's different than the requirements for ship containers under that standard. And of course, OSHA allows you to decide on the method of information of exchange. There's no specific requirements on how that has to happen, mainly because a lot of that is really just performance-based where it's, it's an act that you're performing specifically with another employer and they don't really wanna muddy the waters in terms of how that communication will happen. Uh, each employer on a multi-employer worksite must also make a written HASCOM program available to their own employees, whether they generate the hazard or the hazard is generated by other employers on the site. But if you have any other questions on these specific aspects of the written HASCOM program, then please feel free to send that into the chat um, and we'll hopefully be able to get to those uh, later on. Of course, we often get questioned on who's qualified to even present HASCOM training or if a person needs to be certified to do so. And I see a few of you have actually asked that question within the chat, so we'll hopefully answer your questions. OSHA doesn't specify who you have present HASCOM training to. Uh, your employees, nor is there any formal certification required to do so. As the employer, you have to determine who's qualified to do the training. However, OSHA does expect that that trainer has the knowledge and understanding to present the information so that it's understandable to all employees and that it's specific to the workplace. The trainer has to essentially be familiar with the requirements of the standard that apply to the workplace, right? So um, before I kind of give you this list, again, OSHA doesn't necessarily say the trainer has to have X, Y, and Z certifications, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Those are, the, those are all good and well. Um, that's not their requirement. Their requirements are that that trainer has to be familiar with the requirements of the standard that apply to the workplace, right? The hazardous chemicals in the workplace to which workers are potentially exposed. So they have to have a good understanding and knowledge of those chemicals. They also have to have the hazard communication program implemented in the workplace. They have to know that. And they often know, they also have to know, my apologies, the protective measures being employed in the workplace to prevent adverse effects from occurring, right? So this person will typically have all of these credentials specifically, but um, OSHA doesn't really have a specific requirement as to what sort of credentials they need to have. That's really going to be on you guys to determine who you trust to present that training. And of course, as you're going through that process, the more documentation you have on how you chose the person the better, of course, should OSHA come knocking. That's just one more form of documentation that shows your good faith effort to provide um, satisfactory training to your employees. You can also provide employees information and training through whatever means are best for them. Although there will always have to be some site specific training such as informing employees of the location and availability of the written program and SDS. Any methods of presenting the material that meet the objectives can be used such as a classroom instruction or even like computer-based learning. That, that type, you know, that style of learning right now is insanely popular. <laughs> Keep in mind that the training must be conducted in a manner and a language that employees can easily understand. Uh, if they receive job instructions in a language other than English, then the training and information to be conveyed under the standard will also need to be conducted in that same language. I'll always consider the education and technical background, I can't stress this one enough, of the employees to ensure that they completely understand the information being given to them. 
For example, if you know employees have a low literacy rate, you may consider verbal instruction as opposed to giving them documents to read. To help ensure that the information is also understood, employees must be allowed the opportunity to ask questions about any issues they do not understand. So when you're thinking about hosting that training or having a trainer come in, um, just think about the time you know, towards the end of that, that session uh, to block off so that way employees can ask questions should they be confused on anything or everything. But um, again, that kind of goes without saying. OSHA also requires that effective training, right? Effective training be provided. And by effective training, OSHA means that the information and training must provide employees with the knowledge that they need and that employees can carry that knowledge from training into their daily jobs. So again, uh, providing training specific to what they do is going to be the most helpful for them. Um, if, you know, you, you know, older generational workers, there's always a stereotype, but um, they like to know exactly how it, how and why, you know, why that applies to what they do, how it applies to what they do. Um, and same with even younger workers now. So just make sure that whatever training you do provide, it is specific to their daily jobs, their tasks and routine. OSHA doesn't really expect that workers will be able to recall and recite all data provided about each hazardous chemical in the workplace. Workers must understand that they're exposed to hazardous chemicals, right? They must know that labels and SDSs can provide them with information on the hazards of a chemical and that these items should be consulted when needed. In addition, they also have to know and have a general understanding of what information is provided on labels and the SDS and how to access them. And lastly, they need to be aware of the protective measures that are available to them and how to access those protective measures. So not only personal protective equipment, but certain things like, um, you know, your eye wash stations or even showers, should they come in contact with any uh, chemicals. Now, while OSHA doesn't require that you evaluate your training program, you may consider doing so to ensure that it's effective for your employees. Um, again, if it's it's one thing to write that program, but then it's another to actually look at it, you know, every six months to a year. Now, that's not, you know, required by OSHA, but it's just a kind of a good rule of thumb. Consider gathering employee feedback on the training they received, what formats work best, and the value of what they learn. This evaluation could be in the form of a sheet to be filled up by employees after their training. Again, when you take in mind that feedback from employees, they really feel included in terms of um, how you're gonna structure your program. So a lot of employees might be more receptive to that specifically. Evaluation should also include observation of how the training has affected employee behavior. For example, if your employees have better compliance, you know, with use of protect, with protective measures like wearing gloves, you know, when they're supposed to, this could factor into the evaluation of the program. If employees are not interested in the training as it's conducted, or they don't appear motivated and don't exhibit any sort of increased knowledge of hazards and the use of protective practices, it may be necessary to review and revise the training to achieve a better outcome. So maybe, you know, there's other things that you could be doing instead of providing, let's say like an hour long training session, maybe you can go to micro learning where you, you know, provide five minute training, you know, once every day and keep it nice and short. Um, and that can be done on, on a tablet, mobile device, however you want to do that. But um, that's one popular method that we've heard of. But again, whatever you can do to make sure that employees are really being receptive to the information that they're getting. Okay, thanks, Derek. So the HASCOM standard does not require employers to maintain records of employee training, but many employers choose to do so. This may help you monitor your own program to make sure that all your workers are appropriately trained. And also keeping records that document who was trained, when the training was conducted, and what was covered is also helpful to document compliance with OSHA's training requirement in case of an inspection. During an inspection, OSHA will talk to workers to determine if they receive training, if they know they're exposed to hazardous chemicals, and if they know where to, to obtain substance-specific information on labels and SDSs. And OSHA doesn't expect that workers will be able to, you know, tell, tell you every single, tell them every single detail about chemicals in the workplace, but really what's most important is that they understand they're exposed to hazardous chemicals. They know how to read and understand the labels and basically have a general understanding of what information is provided in these documents and how to access these tools. If the inspector detects a trend in employee responses that indicates training is not being conducted 
or it's conducted in a cursory fashion that does not meet the intent of this HASCOM standard, OSHA will issue a citation. In addition to the federal OSHA HASCOM standard, which you must comply with, many states and territories have been approved by OSHA to operate their own safety and health programs. These state plan states must have standards that are at least as effective as OSHA's rules, but they may have additional requirements that could involve hazard communication. So if you're in one of these state plan states, you'll need to meet the hazard communication requirements, if any, in your state. And many of these states adopt federal OSHA rules as is, but this is not always the case. And beyond this, any state could have right to know laws and regulations that are more stringent. So in any case, it's a good idea to check your state requirements. Today, we looked at a broad overview of the HASCOM standard and what OSHA requires for training. And while we covered a lot of ground, we hope that you've taken away a better understanding of the requirements. Prior to training, you should read and understand the information and training requirements in the standard. Determine which employees must be trained based on actual or potential exposure to chemicals. Ensure that the person who will do the training is competent and knowledgeable. Decide if you'll train on each individual chemical or group the chemicals based on their shared hazards like flammables. And make sure your training program addresses the hazards of the chemicals in the workplace and the appropriate protective measures. How to read and understand labels and SDSs and how to locate the SDSs chemical inventory and the written program. Your training also should include instructions on what to do with an unlabeled container and what to do when no SDS can be found. And finally, employees must have the opportunity to ask questions during training. Derek? Yeah, thanks again, everyone, for joining us today. But before we move on to questions, I wanted to first address one thing that came up in our, and that regards to our new HASCOM Safety Management Service. Essentially, this service provides support and guidance for these core areas of your HASCOM program. So training, you know, chemical advisory, um, reporting, setup, you know, SDS setup and HASCOM policy reviews. Uh, if you'd like to know more information on the JJ Keller HASCOM Chemical Safety Management Service, just let us know by selecting your interests. And I believe we have a poll. Yep, there it is. Um, just let us know by selecting your interests on the poll. And of course, as a thank you, we'll email you a copy of our compliance brief on OSHA's top seven HASCOM violations. Well, excellent. No, great job, Rachel and Derek. Really appreciate the time and the presentation, and we thank you for the insights and expertise. Before we do get started with the Q&A, just want to remind everyone of the evaluation survey that we're asking you to complete. The survey should be appearing on your screen now, and your input's important because it will help us improve our future webcasts. If you don't see the evaluation survey on your screen, we ask that you please turn off your pop-up blocker. You may also access the survey by clicking the survey button near the lower right part of your screen. Um, additionally, I want to let you know, if you could please now check the chat window at the lower portion of your screen, you should find appearing the URL to a JJ Keller resource guide that will offer market insights and regulatory information to assist with the chemical management process. Again, getting into the, the Q&A as a reminder, and, and I know there's a lot there, but if you do wish to ask a question, simply click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, type your question, and click the send button. And with that, we will get to some questions. First, is there a minimum number of employees for the written program requirement to kick in? No, there's no written, no um, minimum number of employees for that. That basically, I guess, suppose the minimum number would be one. If you have one employee who's exposed to one hazardous chemical, you would need a written program for that. What's the best way to prepare a chemical inventory? Um, probably with that is just to survey the entire workplace and kind of maybe go by work area or be, um, working through the facility um, through each, maybe looking for in each closet or storage area, um, cabinets, and just work systematically through the facility, kind of noting the chemicals in all their forms and thinking about, you know, that might not just be liquids, but they could be solids, gases, vapors, fumes, or or um, mists, and also think about chemicals that might be generated during work operations like welding. Yeah, that's a good point, Rachel. I just wanted to add to Kevin before we move on that um, auditing is also a good way to make sure that you're keeping up with your chemical inventory. 
Um, I know this one typically falls by the wayside, typically because there's just so many chemicals that employers work with throughout, you know, a given year. And so auditing that inventory can also help you keep on top of your inventory as you get it. So just again, just a best practice to just audit as you go through. Um, consider using any inventory software. That's generally really helpful because it kind of takes the work out of your hands and lets the system maintain um, that SDS for you if you have it. So just a few other tips. Well, thank you, Noah. And uh, this next question sort of stays with that theme and it's an, uh, an offshoot and it asks, uh, how often should we update our chemical inventory? Um, OSHA doesn't have a set schedule for updating it, but um, basically if you're, I would say if your chemicals don't change very often, then annually is probably plenty. Um, if they change more often, you may need to review it more frequently, like every few months or something quarterly maybe. Next question, how long do we have to retain an SDS? Um, you would keep that until you get a newer version or an up, updated version of an SDS. Um, if you no longer use a chemical anymore, you would still need to have some record of employee exposure to that chemical. So OSHA says you don't have to retain a paper copy of an SDS um, as long as you have a record of employee exposure to those products, um, such as the identity, the substance, you know, where it was used, and you would need to retain that record for 30 years. And the SDS could be part of that record, but it doesn't have to be as long as you have some record of exposure to that chemical. Next question states, we have many individual chemicals. So how specific does the training need to be or can it be generalized to the category of hazard instead? Yeah, that's a really, that's actually a really tough one, Rachel, feel free to jump in. Um, but essentially, you're going to have to make sure that you train employees based on the chemicals that they're using or the chemicals that they'll potentially be exposed to. I don't believe that OSHA says you can just train generally on, you know, the hazards of a chemical, though, you know, if you do, I can see how that might be a little um, redundant to do that for multiple chemicals. But again, you're going to want to make sure that you train on every aspect of the chemical, not just the hazard itself. And so some chemicals might be a little different in makeup and structure. So again, it just is best practice and as OSHA requires to just train on specific chemicals that the employee will work with or be exposed to potentially. Rachel, was there anything else you want to add? Nope, I think that covers it. Thanks. Moving on, the next one uh, is a secondary container label required if the product is used completely within a single work shift or day. If it's used in the same shift by the same person, it does not need to be labeled. Um, I guess the problem would be if it, you know, if it does get moved, used in the, ne the next shift, you would have to label it in that case. But definitely if it's used in the same shift by the same person, no, you don't have to label that. Another one with SDS, I know you've covered some, some facets of this. Do you have to maintain SDS binders if you use an online service for SDS inventory? Um, you can um, do both ways. I know that OSHA recommends that you have a backup system in case your electronic system goes down. So it wouldn't hurt to have the binders in addition to the electronic versions, but um, that could be a backup system for you in case something goes down. Next one just was looking, um, they admitted they kind of had missed part of it, but wanted to see if you might review just the definition on what is considered hazardous. Or if, if there's a clear definition of that. Um, I, I believe, so OSHA really defines it as the hazardous chemical. And I, I went over that at the beginning, I believe. And um, a hazardous chemical typically by OSHA is defined in that standard as any chemical which can cause a physical or health hazard to employees. And I believe you can find that at 1910.1200 paragraph 
C um, is where you'll be able to find that specific definition. Um, again, the standard defines it as any chemical, and I'm just going to cover this because I just went back to that slide, but it's covered as any chemical which is classified as a physical hazard or health hazard. A simple asphyxiant, add that, a combustible dust, pyrophoric gas, or hazard not otherwise classified. So that's how it's defined within the standard. Thank you. Uh, no, as, as, as we do wind down, just wanted to ask anything from either of you that was left unsaid or anything else you might want our attendees to know on this topic today. Yeah, um, one last thing that I like to tell a lot of folks is documentation is really key when it comes to anything that you do uh, within your own you know, safety programs in your workplace, not just HASCOM, but of course, as we focus on HASCOM today, that's just one that's really key. Um, a lot of people like to think that OSHA is the big bad wolf that's out to come get you, but that's not the case at all. And um, the more documentation that you have to provide them, should they come knocking on your door, uh, the better, because it really does show that good faith effort that, you know, you're trying your best to keep employees as safe as possible. And that's the main goal, right, is that we all want our employees to go home the same way they came into work and that's safe to their friends and family and loved ones. So um, although that's a little bit of an aside from the documentation aspect, it, it all really kind of ropes into what your safety culture is like in your workplace and, and how that pans out for your employees in terms of their own safety. Rachel, any parting thoughts for you? No, I think that about covers it. Thank you. Okay. No, thank you. And, and again, we appreciate you both. Uh, fortunately, we have run out of time. Sorry that we didn't get to everyone's questions, but all today's unanswered questions will be forwarded on to Rachel and Derek. Uh, once again, we hope that you take the time to fill out that evaluation survey on your screen or in the forthcoming email and give your feedback. And then just once more a reminder, if, if you've not clicked uh, the link in the chat window to, to download the resource, please do so. Um, with that, we end today's Safety and Health Magazine webcast. We'd like to thank Rachel Krupsack, Derek Plowden, everyone at JJ Keller, and all of you who listened in. Thanks and have a great day.